This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to Tao Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. I'm your host, Ido Aroni, and today I'm very, very happy to host with us the Vice President of Tel Aviv University in charge of Research and Development, Professor Dan Peer. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. I have your, your uh, CV in front of me. Uh, I would need an, a full hour just to go over your CV. Let me just share with our listeners that you published over 150 scientific articles and books, and you are registered over 130 patents. I should mention also that you're one of the reasons Israel is the world leader in the number of publications published Uh, per capita, scientific publications, and the number of patents registered per capita. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is tell us a little bit about your background. I, I know there's an interesting story of where were you born and how you were brought up. Yes, so I was born actually inside the Weizmann Institute of Science without any connection to science, uh, nor my parents were involved in, in science. But, uh, you know, it was a shortcut from where we lived, and my mother just uh, decided to, um, to <laughs> settle down near the small gate at the Weizmann Institute and having a new baby. So that was like a, a natural birth. I would say I was maternally imprinted to become a scientist. This is an incredible story. I think it should be the headline of your bio. Uh, <laughs> so when did you discover that you're drawn to science? So I was actually a very bad student, really. I, was, I wasn't intrigued by anything, but uh, I was a little bit intrigued by phenomena, scientific phenomena, you know, why the sun is shining, something like this. And... I was curious, but as I mentioned, I was a very bad student. So in high school, I, um, I was living in, in Rishon Lezion, which is not too far from Rehovot. And I basically went and um, spent some time outside the, um, science, the Youth for Science, they call it back then, Uh, at the Weizmann Institute, outside, not inside. And at some point, a very nice guy with a German accent approached me and he said, why are you not inside? And I said, well, you know, probably because nobody will accept me. I'm a very bad student. And he decided to make a project out of me. And he took me and once a week basically um, taught me physics. Remarkable guy. Uh, his name was Shalevet Freyer, a very famous uh, person. Yes, of course, one of the fathers of uh, Israel's nuclear science. Yes. And also the person behind the Weizmann Science Park and also behind the initiative of Youth for Science. And um, every week for about two and a half years, I spent... Uh, learning about some physical phenomenon. He was a physicist by training. Uh, he started his uh, studies very old. Before that, he did many other things. Um, and he really inspired me to become a scientist. By the way, it's important to note that Jalhevet's mother was also very much involved as an inspirational figure for youth. Her name was Recha Freyer, and she was a, a legendary leader of pre-statehood. Uh, Israel. Exactly. And so at some point, um, I decided I want to be a scientist. I, didn't, I wasn't sure if it's going to be a chemist or biologist or physicist, but I decided this is what I need to do. That's an incredible story. So would you say that Chalhevet Fayer uh, was your mentor? Yes, for many reasons, yes. And, you know, when he passed away, I was already out of, from the army. And then I decided that I need to study. You know, I need to make my exams because I, I didn't have a high school diploma. And because of him, I decided that this is what I need to do. 
and I studied. That's incredible. So fast forward to October 2020. You're being appointed as the vice president of Tel Aviv University. I should mention it's the largest campus that we have in Israel. Um, and what does a vice president in charge of research and development do? On a day-to-day uh, life, I'm responsible of recruitment of new faculty members, making sure that they have a jump start, the best we can offer them, including funding, but also you know educating them. How is the university built? What is the infrastructure? What can we help them and how can we help them? And also I'm responsible directly on the university infrastructure, everything from computers to where we're sitting, as well as um, interdepartment, interdepartment um, equipment, uh, huge equipment, small equipment, microscopies, super resolutions one, uh, atomic force microscopies, anything you imagine come through our office. So you're in charge of the software, so to speak, the conceptual recruitment, and then also the hardware, the facilities. That's a, yeah. quite a big responsibility. Uh, would you say that there's a, a trend now of Israeli scientists developing interest in returning to Israel to pursue their scientific interests? I think so. I think so. I think this is a wonderful country and also a wonderful university. And I think the multidisciplinarity that you can experience at Tel Aviv University is very unique. You have scientists sitting nearby musicians. You have physicians sitting nearby engineers. You have, you know, artists from different fields like uh, theater that working with computer scientists to create, you know, kind of a new type of theater. I think that bringing together different people from with different skills could really only happen in a very diverse, very comprehensive university like Tel Aviv University. And, and diversity, of course, creates friction, and friction is the engine that drives creativity. For sure. Uh, before we jump into your specific area of expertise, um, I'd like to ask you a general question about Israel's ties with Europe, with Asia, with North America in terms of research and development, as a person in such a high position, what would you like to see improving in that department going forward? So I think part of it is, you know, becoming more international. Becoming more international, except from being a cliche, it's also being able to recruit the best minds, not only Israelis, ex-Israelis, or not necessarily Jewish, okay? And we have some recruitments like this at Tel Aviv University. We want to recruit the best, you know, it's a global competition, the best of the best, the brightest, the smartest people, the most creative one, to make sure that this university will excel. And we have... You know, islands of super excellent, it's not only excellent, super excellent, pioneering different fields in the world. So to my best of the knowledge, this is one part. The second part is giving our students the opportunity to interact with other universities, other places in the world, other laboratories in excellent places, and seeing the culture and visiting there and inspired by different people in different areas. This makes your life super interesting, very unique. And I, I can only give you from my experience as a PhD student, I had the luxury of spending just a few months in Cambridge University in the UK. And then just a few months later in MIT, which is in Massachusetts, basically, uh, but basically in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I've worked with two exceptional scientists in totally different field. As a PhD student, this is inspiring because, you know, the first one in Cambridge, UK was a Nobel laureate and the second one will probably be one. So <laughs> I think that this already gives you a bit of a sense how a graduate student from Tel Aviv University who find himself, you know, in top labs in the world learning technologies that eventually will come back to the university 
and will be developed here and even more pronounced will be creating something which is completely new. We are inspired by the people that we that surround us usually. Now, what would you say are the areas uh, in which Tel Aviv University is exceptionally remarkable scientifically? So I don't want to shame any discipline, but in fact, I think we're very strong in AI and data science, very strong in nanotechnologies, in different type of nanotechnology, from printing, you know, hearts to cyber uh, tissues that have electronics with biology together, for molecular electronics, for uh, unique nanomedicine that can change the world. One of them we already experienced recently, like the vaccines, uh, mRNA vaccines. And I think that, you know, this is in a nutshell what we are very strong in. We are also very strong in different types of computational analysis, in bioinformatics, okay? And I probably missed about 100 different fields as well. So you, you said basically from a layman's per perspective, what I heard is two things, nano, and the other is quantum computing, which is the compute, computational power. Um, can you simplify it for the person who is listening to us right now who's not necessarily a scientist? What's the story with nano? So we're talking about the ability to control tiny materials, either from bottom up to build them or the opposite from top down approach we can take a material and make it very 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 small at what I, level at the level of uh, 10 to the minus 9 meter so smaller than the molecule itself smaller than the molecule yeah. so what are the advantages of our ability to re-engineer the material at such a small fraction just imagine that we can build a lot of things with this. We can store data with this. What are we going to do with all the wonderful pictures that we now take with our cell phones? Where are we going to store them? Yesterday, I just saw that my daughter, my youngest daughter, has 40,000 pictures in her cell phone. Okay, she doesn't have any more storage. She asked me, what do I do with this? Where do I put this? And I told her on the computer, this is actually a very large amount of data. What are we going to do with all the data? So one can say we can storage in the cloud. But even in the cloud, there is space limitation. So with novel nanotechnologies, we can have faster storage, we can have more in-deep storage, we can have more calculations that can do faster and, and more efficient. And it gives you also the opportunity to create new things that we didn't even think about this. When I told my daughter, and she was shocked, that I, my first cell phone I got when I was 35 years old. <laughs> and she says, unbelievable. I mean, I'm 12 and I already had a few, right? So right. how come you don't have cell phone? And I told her, you know, when I was young, we didn't have color TV. Okay, so technology runs very, very fast. Right, when I was young, there was no TV. I, my parents bought our first TV set when I was 16. So I was deprived of all the uh, wonders of television. But nanotechnology, at least in theory, can also change the very nature of materials, right? We can create materials with unbelievable degree of elasticity or strength. Right. right. And that would, uh, when do you think this would actually be applicable? I think it's already is applicable. And I'm going to go back to this example. You know, in um, December 2020, just two years ago, or less than two years ago, the FDA and other regulatory agencies like the European Medical Agency approved an emergency vaccine made from RNA, pieces of RNA that express a protein and wrapped with basically lipids. So wait, before we jump into, this is your area of expertise. Yes. So I noticed that there's a very intriguing term in your bio, which combines two words, one medicine, which is obvious, but the other is translation. So you are an expert 
in a field called translational medicine. What is it? So translational medicine is taking an idea, a concept idea that you just invented in your lab, and you want to stick the needle to a human being. Because, you know, we have a lot of experience in healing mice. And if I were a mouse, I, was, I would be very happy because I can be cured from all diseases. At least this is what the uh, common uh, uh, <laughs> journals now <laughs> say. But basically, there is a gap between our preclinical work in animal models and our human uh, capacity. So this gap needs to be translated. And this gap is exactly what we are working on taking an academic idea and accelerating it into uh, the first in human, the first clinical trial, to see how people experience this. Is it toxic? Is it, you know, tolerable? How much they can tolerate? And potentially, if there is smell of oil, if it's going to be very successful. And, and to what degree this field of medicine involves working with the regulators, FDA and others? So, you know, at Tel Aviv University, we, we are established something very, very unique, which is a SPARC program based on the original SPARC uh, program uh, generated about 15, 16 years ago in Stanford by an ex-graduate of Tel Aviv University as well, uh, Dalia Mushli Rosen. And basically, we bring together physicians and scientists with exactly this thing. We want to educate them to be able to translate their idea into the clinic with the help of the regulators. Okay, so taking a known drug, for example, Prozac, that is known to be an antidepressant, and using it for cancer is relatively simple. Right, but because you need because to have it was have already some, approved. It's already approved. You're going to use the same doses, but for other patients. Now you can say that some cancer patients are also a bit suppressed. Okay, so that could be also good for them. But if there is another mechanism that could help, so taking those known drug already and repurpose them into different indications, that should be a fast track. We don't need to wait for a long time, and we don't need to invest one or two billion dollars for that. So you're creating a, a whole secondary market for the same drug. Yes. Which uh, is applicable already, it can happen immediately. Exactly. But you need to tailor the right clinical trial, the right readouts, and basically make sure that you have the right champions that the clinicians that will push it into the clinic. Now, you mentioned mRNA, and I know nothing about it. All I know from reading the papers during the pandemic, that it's a new system of developing a vaccination. Can you tell us a little bit, what, what are the differences in principle between the old system and the new system? So the old system is mostly based on viruses, that are either dead viruses or, I would say, uh, less effective viruses, and that basically introduce them into the body and then the immune system recognize them. The use of mRNA has been around, it was discovered in 1961. But the application for vaccines is fairly new, from 1993. And then over the years, it was unsuccessful. There are probably two reasons. One is very technical. There is some modification that needs to be done on the mRNA, on the messenger RNA. And to make a long story short, we have the DNA, our genetic material, that is being transcribed to a messenger RNA, which is basically a messenger. And then at the end, it will be translated into a desired protein. And this mechanism, you know, of how to translate mRNA to a protein was discovered and a Nobel Prize was given to three people. One of them is Adayonat, so another Israeli pride of that. But basically, our understanding of mRNA is already more than 50 or 60 years old. But the translation into something meaningful 
took quite a long time. So one challenge, as I mentioned, was basically those special modification to make sure it will be translated inside the cell. But the second was the delivery, the bus or the taxi, how we package this, how we deliver it specifically to the right cells. And what happens if it goes to the wrong cells? And this is basically my area of, of expertise, mostly on, on different types of RNAs. So I would say you're in a very good position to address the concerns that people had during the pandemic with uh, mRNA-based vac- vaccination. Can, can you tell us a little bit about, about the safety of it? About the, and if there were concerns, uh, can you explain why people were so concerned? Yeah, so I, I can understand, you know, that anything new, people are more afraid. And there was a notion that we are talking about genetic material. But mRNA is temporarily. It's not changing the DNA. It's not interfering with your genes. It's something very, very uh, transient, very temporary. So I think the concerns were fine because any new drug, any new vaccine, there are concerns. But now talking after less than two years and more than 14.7 billion doses that have been given to people just from with mRNA vaccines, I, I think that there is no drug or no vaccine in the world that have been given so much in less than two years. We learn from it that You know, there might be adverse effect like in any other new strategy or old strategy, not more than, not less than, but definitely it seems that science won here. It changed the world. Changed the world, it means that people came back and started working again. Everything was open. We don't have masks anymore. Just imagine you're now flying without masks. You're flying. You're getting out from your which, home. Which brings another question, which I think you're qualified to answer. Uh, what does it mean for other diseases in the future? So we are probably under an evolution of pathogens. They're already here. There are different types of... But it seems that you know minor modifications could very fast create a new vaccine with the mRNA technology. And, you know, in the U.S., they started a 100 days response team. Also in Japan recently. Also in the U.K., there is a 99 days, maybe because the U.K. wants to be first, 90 day in a, a response team, that within less than 100 days, you will get a new vaccines. So if there is a new, very dangerous pathogen, there is a way to accelerate all the, uh, basically, the, the process in a very effective way. So what you're saying is that the system is now in place. All we need is to remodify, recalibrate. And for then viruses. De- for viruses. Yes. And, yes. And, and deploy whenever yes. we need. Yes. Um, Not for bacteria, but for viruses. Right. Bacteria are more sophisticated sometimes. If you can elaborate on that. So bacteria has a different relationship with our immune system than viruses. Viruses are completely parasites, okay? They don't have a life on their own. They need our cells to produce new viruses. So relatively, the immune system can eventually recognize them and attack them and neutralize them. In bacteria, it's a different story. Some of them are creatures, I mean, they are, you know, one cell organism, but basically they have sometimes more sophisticated way to be stealth from the immune system. And, you know, one of them is a very famous, uh, we call it the killer bacteria. Okay, the killer bacteria is just a streptococcus, uh, a classical uh, streptococcus that we have in our uh, throat normally, but for some reason it becomes much more aggressive. And we don't really know why. But it has a very unique mechanism by which he deploys or he he protects himself, the bacteria, and the immune system doesn't recognize him for at least two to three weeks. And then it's too dangerous. It's probably too late. So 
they find different ways to cope with our immune system, which is very sophisticated. But I think with bacteria, we didn't solve it yet. So, and there is another issue that we need to talk about this. In 2015, according to the World Health Organization, the issues here in the world will be antibiotic resistance. So you won't be able to kill easily bacteria because they are already resistant to your antibiotic or to your panel of antibiotics. This is why new therapies or new vaccines are needed. Among them, one of the most prominent ones are messenger RNA vaccines. And in fact, we have developed something like this, which we hope will be the first one in bacteria, and antibiotic-resistant bacteria, that can be a vaccine, again, a very aggressive a form of plague. And this is right here in Tel Aviv University. When you say we develop, yes. it's right here at Tel Aviv University. Right here at Tel Aviv University, it's, uh, and hopefully will be published soon, under review. But it's, it's a revolution, because basically until now, for the past five years, even the most successful companies in the mRNA space say that you cannot develop something like this to bacteria. Now, from your vantage point, there's no question that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, changed many aspects of our lives. We were told that this huge economic machine could never be stopped, and indeed it stopped for at least three months and changed many, many things. In your world, what were the main positives if we can say, in terms of scientific research beyond the fact that uh, mRNA was approved so quickly? So, I'll tell you a story, and then I'll answer your uh, question. The story was that in 2009, I submitted a grant to the U.S. National Institute of Health with a friend of mine, a new uh, professor at Harvard called Derek Rossi. And Derek uh, did some very, very elegant experiments of modified mRNA, and I specialized in delivery, and we did some lipid nanoparticles. And we brought together two different technologies into one, and we submitted this grant for the NIH in the title of Modified mRNA with Lipid Nanoparticles as a new platform for vaccines. It was never reviewed. And Derek was very upset. A year later, he started a company, left the academia. The company name is Moderna. <laughs> and, well, he did well. Now he's a venture capitalist, left Moderna a few years uh, later. Anyhow, and I stayed. <laughs> and I think that we're struggling from a scientific standpoint. And this is to your question. We're struggling to be recognized as you know, innovative approach. And all the grants I wrote from 2008 to 2013-14, most of them were rejected based on the fact that nobody believed us. And I got, you know, very upsetting remarks saying this is practically will never work. You cannot scale it up. It's very complex. DNA vaccines, they were already around, are not successful. So why do you think the mRNA vaccines will be better? We're specializing in therapy, multiple dosing. Nobody believed us that you can get, you know, enough efficient dose and control it. So we got a lot of rejections. So for us, this is a revolution. Now people believe us. And now all my grants are granted very easily, which is great on one hand. On the other hand, you think about scientists. Scientists need to be very open-minded. This is what we believe science should be, right? You come with a new concept, new idea, and you prove it to some extent, or the best you can. And still, scientists are very conservative. Not all of them, but the majority. And you need to find the one that believes in you and believes in what you're saying. And when we published the first systemic cell-specific delivery of mRNA in one of the Nature Journal just a few years ago, people believed us. 
At that point, and that was much before COVID, we were approached by a small German company named BioNTech that started to collaborate with us because they believed in us. And I remember my first meeting in 2014 with Kathy, Kathleen Carrico, that is a very famous lady now. And she said, you're the future. You are the future. She also got uh, honorary casa uh, a doctorate uh, from Tel Aviv University last year. So I think that it was nice to get this recognition after a few years of depression. And you know, depression in science means lack of funding. Lack of funding means that you cannot do your job. And by the way, um, I'm sure that some of the people that listen to us right now, some of our listeners, uh, would probably be very interested in trying to find ways to help you um, and to uh, fulfill all your, all your dreams and all your plans. And, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately our time is up but I, I just wanted to thank you not only for educating us and myself, but also for your inspirational message. What you essentially said is that don't give up. Every rejection is bringing you closer to the acceptance. Every no is bringing you closer to the yes. And on this happy note, I'd like to thank Professor Dan Peer and to thank all of you, our listeners and our viewers back home. Until the next episode, bye-bye. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer.